I got a lot of shit on my mind. This is the part where you're supposed to smile. Listen, a uh, couple things. Let me introduce uh, Braxton Carter, the CFO. Well, it's kind of a gang group here. Uh, Neville Ray, the CTO. Mike Seaver, who was the CMO and now is the Chief Operating Officer. Niels Pehrman, who's the uh, head of IR and possibly the best export from Germany to T-Mobile US of all. Uh, Peter Ewens is here as well, head of M&A, and Dave Carey, uh, Executive Vice President, is uh, somewhere back in the booth. I want to give a special, you know, kind of shout out to this team. You'll notice by the voices, the uh, flu epidemic that you had here in Germany last week made its way across this team, so the voices are in various uh, stages of completeness, and uh, I give them a lot of credit for, you know, getting up here and hanging in. Um, Listen, first and foremost, most important thing is we wanted to be here um, as part of DT. And you know, I'm, what we're going to do today is I'm going to do a couple things. One is I'm going to do a look back at Capital Markets Day of 2012, which should be fun, uh, and where we've come. Then I'm going to give you a quick update on where T-Mobile US is right now. But then, you know, I wouldn't uh, call it a deep strategy dive, but why does it work? And how will it be sustainable? Uh, a quick uh, run through the team. And then our, you know, as we've called it, the outlook. A uh, couple of things that are important to us. And you know, it, the important part here is we're very proud to be uh, an integrated part of Deutsche Telekom. And I think what you're going to see, you know, you go back to 2012, what we've accomplished at T-Mobile was you know, started here as an integrated, controlled subs subsidiary of DT. And I want to give a special kind of acknowledgement to Tim and to the leadership team, because this is not easy. Uh, you know, as you see the strategy here of being a leading European telco, but then to have this component of your business that's extremely valuable and extremely important to shareholders, but, it, you know, it's unpredictable and it's requiring constant increases in capital and focus. But to be able to do that while sustaining and integrating that strategy for Europe is a big deal. I also want to acknowledge uh, you know, my fellow leadership team members on Deutsche Telekom. This is not easy. And you know, when you're trying to be a key component of the leading European telco, and you come in with your ideas, and your father says, tough shit, we have to send the money to the US, uh, it's tough. So, you know, when we see right now where the DT stock is and the outlook for the company and for uh, T-Mobile US, I want to just most importantly be here to acknowledge that's not easy. Uh, and on behalf of you, the shareholders of DT, uh, Tim and the leadership team have done an incredible job. And, and that's amongst the most important things that, uh, that we came here to say. So with that, I thought it'd be fun. How many of you were here in 2012 at Capital Markets Day? OK, have a little fun with this. Um, let me do this. I'm going to run a very short video and see if you remember this from December 6th, 2012. Dave, why don't you put this on? I'm the new chief executive officer of uh, T-Mobile US. What I'm really going to focus on today uh, is the initiatives that we're undertaking around what I call becoming the uncarrier. And part of the challenger strategy is to be different, to be bold. Okay, it's a tough audience, by the way. The most I've ever behaved in my life. What we're finding as a challenger is right now, customers are really still pissed off at very unpredictable billing, very unclear pricing. We think there is huge room for a challenger to change some of that. We're moving 100% to value plans in 2013. This is a big deal, and it's step one of the kind of things that we're gonna do to disrupt the industry. Trust me, we've got three or four more that are coming, and then a customer service experience that matches it. Everything we're doing is gonna be to cure big pain points that customers can't stand, and finally, We've got a full bag of weapons, no distractions, no missing devices, no inferior network, good leadership team. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, so who, who is here? Yeah, did you totally call bullshit on that whole presentation when we did that? 
I, I can't describe to you the look on people's faces when I came in here. And I was thinking to myself, I want to take a mulligan. I mean, this is, you know, what, what in effect I realized is that so many times we had heard, you know, hey, this is the, this is the change. This is what's going to happen. This time it's different in the U.S. And by the way, when it does, it's got huge upside. And, you know, and then there's this guy, um, you know, the uh, younger, thinner version of me, um, who's telling you, you know, with absolutely no wireless experience and pretty clear during the Q&A that I didn't have the foggiest idea what any of the shit I was talking about was, <laughs> was going to be the catalyst for this to go through. Um, and, you know, that was the precursor to some pretty, you know, broad uh, assessments. Um, let me just uh, play the tape back for you. It, at that particular point in time, we had 33 million customers. This was before Metro PCS. Braxton and I were standing here, and what we were facing was a proxy battle in order to potentially get Metro PCS. Um, Nine million customers if we were successful. We, had, uh, we were losing two plus million customers a year, and while we were standing here, that period we lost a half a million customers. So that's what we were playing into. The churn was about 2.5 to 2.6 percent, which right now, to give you an idea, that's the hemorrhaging that Sprint's doing in the U.S. that we're also, you know, flabbergasted by. We were number four in J.D. Powers for sales and care. And the reason we were at a whopping fourth is there were only four. Um, you know, otherwise we would have been a little bit lower. We had a, a, an amount of LTE in our network of zero. And we were hoping to get the iPhone, and all of a sudden, Apple demanded that we have LTE. And our brand was completely categorized by the young woman on the motorcycle that everybody loved. Uh, her name was Carly, by the way. But after they watched the commercial, nobody wanted to do anything. It was just, wow, she was really pretty. I like that motorcycle. What company was that? And that was kind of where we were. Cost structure, by the way, was fat. EBITDA margins were in the mid-20s, which really wasn't where it should be, because uh, we were generating a tremendous amount of cash. The U.S. market was somewhat saturated, the duopoly was entrenched, and Washington was supporting them. And interestingly, at that point in time, the plan of record called for postpaid stabilization. So the goal that everybody called bullshit on us for was that in the year of 2013, we wouldn't grow, but we would stop shrinking. And then in 2014, we would slightly grow. Um, prepaid would be the growth engine of the business. Service revenue was expected to grow 3 to 5 percent compound annual, EBITDA 7 to 10 percent, uh, and cash flow 15 to 20, which, you know, these were bold statements. So just a quick scorecard. Um, I sat there that day and said, you know, if and when we pull this off, I'm coming back. And I'm going to look all those folks in the face, and I'm, I can't aspire to make them laugh, because I'm pretty sure there's no sense of humor in the room, except you. You seem to have a great sense of humor. Uh, the guy next to you, none at all, by the way. And the guy next to him is scared shit. I'm going to call on him like a kid in class. So Metro PCS did close. Uh, and remember, that's when we became a public company. And we went public at the end of the first day of trading. It was $16 a share. I think it's 32 something. The market's not open. Um, we said that we would generate six to seven billion dollars worth of synergies. And what we'll talk about today is we've actually going to generate nine to 10 billion. But here's the interesting thing that Tim, Tim talked about yesterday. What's actually happening is we have in the big fear of a big customer migration. We've migrated 89% of the 8.9 million customers that came over, over to our network with new handsets. And in the meantime, we've added 2 million more customers. So Metro PCS has been a great uh, business. We had 15 cities and 6,000 doors with Metro. We now have 55 cities and 11,000 doors. Um, and let's talk about customers. We have 55 million customers now. 13 million net ads in the last two years in addition to Metro. And by the way, in 2014, what percentage of the postpaid phone nets in the United States industry do you think T-Mobile took? A hundred. Uh, we took three times as many as Verizon, five times as many as AT&T, and for those of you that are good at algebra, we took infinity times Sprint uh, as they were negative. Big deal, though, is the concept of the uncarrier. 
And the first thing we uncarried was ourself. Um, big consumer advocate, solving pain points in a way to structurally change the industry. And we've done eight uncarrier moves. Our tone and our brand says it all, that we won't stop. Quick side note, this is a fascinating experiment. We are Deutsche Telekom. Keep that in mind. And as our leadership team and as Tim sits together and watches what T-Mobile is doing in the US, we're doing it in phases as a defense, as an attack on a lot of what you've seen presented here as Deutsche Telekom. And in a fascinating way, what DT has the ability to do is to learn uh, what to do to itself from doing it to people like it in other countries. You know, what not to do. And so I think it's a fascinating, I think uh, as Claudia talked, Claudia owns a number of the countries that are, you know, using similar strategies and tactics. And I think good questions I heard yesterday were things like, why don't we do more in Netherlands like we do here? And I think that's a great, great possibility for Deutsche Telekom. Um, Interesting, and this is the where it will continue. Right now, the SOGA, the share of gross ads in the postpaid side is 26%. Uh, that's up from 9%, okay, and this is only two years. It's 46% year over year. Porting ratios, if you know what that is, tracking on a postpaid side, the porting from one carrier to another. We ported 2.15 with the entire industry last year, and this is a, st a staggering fact. Never once ever in any week did any carrier port positive with T-Mobile. Verizon, AT&T, never was there a week where they had more of our customers going to them than um, them to us. And let me help you. One of the big questions always that would come from Tim would come from you. What happens when the big guys wake up and crush you? They can't. When you piss customers off for so long, and then you wake up and think you're gonna tell that customer, hey, I'm sorry I screwed you for 10 years, but now that T-Mobile's taking customers, I'm gonna be nice to you. They don't give a shit. That's the big learning. And so there's an awful lot we're gonna learn on here. Churn, by the way, my plan was for Churn to go from 2.5 to 1.9 to 1.8 to 1.7 by the end of 2016 to get to 1.69. Um, it went to 1.5 last year. It was 1.6, it's running about 1.5 right now. So way ahead, churn, SOGA, those are the two big variables. Customer care, we were number one in JD Power, is up from number four last year. Uh, we just in the recent survey moved to number two, but that has really been a cultural change in the company. 100% uh, move to value plans. Listen, it was a story when we were here last time. We've now abolished contracts. Um, 89% of our customers are now on simple choice, so we're on the other side of it. I hinted about the iPhone when I here in 2012. Not only launched the iPhone, launched the iP uh, iPad with free data for life, and um, we just had the biggest iPhone quarter in launch uh, in the company's history with an 11% upgrade rate uh, in Q4. So full lineup of devices and a tremendous amount of reason to switch prepaid, we're the number one prepaid carrier in the U.S. with 16.3 million customers. And on the postpaid side, um, moving right through all the uncarried initiatives, including contract freedom, we uh, clearly have had the biggest surprise there. We're going to talk about network. Neville, by the way, used to be the sixth most powerful person in the United States wireless industry. Uh, since I've come in, he's disappeared and vanished from the list. But we've paid him excessively, so he'll stay here and be happy. Um, but it's a, he's a legacy as to what we've done. We have the fastest, this isn't marketing, we have the fastest LTE network in the United States. And that's a big deal from where we were. The network vision has gone from a no apologies network and even to the shock of my board at, uh, at uh, TMUS and DT, we've migrated from wanting to have an urban, dense, populated area network to wanting to and being on the way to having the best, complete, overall wireless network in the US, bigger and better than Verizon and AT&T. And that's what we're investing against and we're making great strides on. And finally, people are worrying, you know, holy shit, these guys just might do it. Um, cost structure is a core competence of ours that we'll talk about as well. And um, 
Overall, the spectrum is a big deal. We're doing quite well. You'll see a lot of noise in Washington. And the big story, of course, is the financial results. Um, the service revenue last year grew 9% year over year. Q4 was 14% year over year. Uh, overall revenue is 14% in Q4, uh, overall year, and 20% year over year, and EBITDA has kicked in. So the story from Capital Markets Day, I think, is quite uh, complete. So I use that as a segue. Now we can move uh, very quickly, because I want to get to Q&A, because uh, this is open to Twitter, right? Let me help you. The people that follow me on Twitter are very entertaining. So that very intellectual set of questions that you all asked, wait till you see the one and a half million whack jobs that follow me on Twitter, start sending their questions in, uh, and I think it'll be rather entertaining, and we'll mix those in. So key messages for uh, the uncarrier, and Mike will give you the update on it, but the key messages as to how we're doing. 55 million customers. We are the third biggest player in the United States now. Uh, we have moved past Sprint. We have our sights set on number two, which is what really makes people think this time that we're out of our minds. Uh, but stay focused. We had four million postpaid phone nets in um, last year. So you think about where we started from and where we are. 16.3 prepaid customers, uh, million and growing. And as I said, the service revenue and adjusted EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA, Year over year, Q4 was up 41%, and it was 30% sequentially. So the story here that I'm going to hand off to the guys is that the uncarrier is leading to customer growth, which is leading to revenue growth, which is driving profitability. So the model that we've laid out is uh, and will working, is working and will continue to. And the synergies on the Metro PCS side uh, are tremendous and way over what we'd anticipated to get. Uh, the network, I think we'll let Neville talk about. We'll talk about the AWS three auctions in some fashion. They're very important going forward as well. Now, that's the, um, the overall uh, look. This could scare you. Um, Tim and I have had a number of conversations that are generally related to, don't you think you're doing too much? And if you look at this chart since last time we were here, the movement from 33 million to 55 million customers, 22 million additional customers, eight uncarrier moves, uh, merger with Metro PCS, going public, the network deployment that we're working through, and a number of big branding and marketing moves. Uh, what I can tell you is this will not stop. The pace at which we're moving will continue to move at that rate, if not accelerate. Uncarrier 9 and 10 are closer than you can anticipate, uh, and we'll continue to roll out behind them. Quick update, by the way, on each of these. 89% of the customer base has moved to simple choice, so we're in a totally different phase. We have almost 10 million customers on jump, Uncarrier 2. We have a 36-fold increase in international data usage. Uh, by the way, another one of those things that I think is under, underplayed. We've eliminated 1.6 million contracts in Uncarrier 4. We've offered, we're offering a million test drives in Uncarrier 5. 79 million songs are streamed per day free uh, on Uncarrier 6. 33 million Wi-Fi devices on our network and 68 million plus gigs of free data have been uh, handed out on our network from a data stash standpoint. Um, this, um, this model is really a sustainable one. If you look at the growth and what's happening now from a standpoint of revenue growth, we're shifting the acquisition model from single line to multi-line, much better churn profile. Uh, the operating leverage and the cost uh, per customer acquisition is very good. The EBITDA and the cash flow that follows is something that I think is very important for you all to see in the next chapter of uh, the Uncarrier. I won't take you through what we're doing relative to the competition, but if you can see the revenue growth, the, the interesting thing is it's linear. If you look at the growth on the left-hand side as it relates to additions and you look at the service revenue growth, you can also extrapolate out now 
to what's happening with the adjusted EBITDA growth. So there was a lot of confusion around ARPU um, as it relates to the average revenue per user because we moved to a model that separated devices from rate plans. Most important part to look at it is the average billing per user. $61.80 in Q4 is the highest we've ever had in the history of the company. $108.95 on the average revenue per account, and $5.64 billion of EBITDA last year, $1.74 in Q4. EBITDA margins have moved to 30% from where they were, and it was 41% year over year in Q4. So you can see the trajectory. Also, um, leading to what Braxton will cover from a standpoint of, uh, of cash flow. Let me just um, turn this over to Mike by flip to the next one, uh, Dave, if you're listening. Okay, so those are impressive numbers. Uh, they're very impressive statistics. The issue that I want to hand off to Mike to now cover with you is why? How does it work? Is it, is it sustainable? You know, this is... We are a very focused business. We're, we are a, for the most part so far, a consumer wireless company. Very simple in the transparent approach. What we're doing here, the uncarrier strategy and initiative, it's a phenomenon. It's a, it's a cultural revolution in the United States around you know, what customers see as the single most important device in their life that they hate the experience on. And when we all announced this together, there were components that weren't ready for the company. And I had a conversation with a couple of you yesterday that you were kind of startled by what you saw when you did come in the sales and service experience and in the network experience, how differentiated it was. And what I want you to understand is when we started this, the key was launch the uncarrier, but no, that your sales and service model has to change considerably, that your network's not ready, and you don't have the money. So in effect, what we did right after Capital Markets Day is we went into our business and we funded this transition as much as we could by lowering operating costs, $1.7 billion in 13, $1.1 billion in 14, and the sales experience and the service experience is changing dramatically, and it will continue to change each year going forward. The network has changed dramatically, and there's plenty of cost more to get. So that's the sustainable model that we're going to focus. Very simple, very transparent. Take it up. So when we say our strategy is uncarrier, our strategy as a company is uncarrier. What's that mean? It's really pretty simple. It, what it means is we expect, and our ambition is to be famous as the company that's changing wireless for the better. Not, not having people be aware of us, not being known for it, um, but being famous as the company changing wireless for the better. Whether those are our customers at T-Mobile, whether they're customers that are still stuck at AT&T or Verizon or Sprint. That's our mission as a company, and that's what has driven us over these last couple of years. Now, as John said, we know that having an ambition and having a mission as a company, having something really clear that we stand for isn't enough if you don't back it up. And that's why the strategy has got the pillars underneath it that we talked about. Now, a couple of things that, that it's not. Let me just make sure that we're really clear that when we talk about being famous as the company changing wireless for the better, there are multiple parts to it. It's not just about slashing our prices. By the way, we're a great value at T-Mobile. We've been a great value all along. We were a great, we had low prices years ago during the bleeding that John talked about a few minutes ago in 2011 and 2012. We had great prices then. Sprint, who's you know, recently been trying to rise from the dead, they, they've basically slashed their prices. That's not what our strategy has been about. Our strategy is about offering customers the best of both a great value that's been a consistently good value over time, but a fantastic service that's truly differentiated, built on a great network, built on a group of people that are just passionate about giving a great experience. Because as John said, this device is way too important in our customers' lives for them to buy just on price. That's not something that's gonna be attractive to a lot of people. There are some. And we serve them. We've got great brands like Walmart Family Mobile that are targeted towards people that mainly want to shop on price. But our flagship brands, both T-Mobile and Metro PCS, offer something more. 
offer a great set of experiences for customers. And over time, we've been very consistent about our pricing. And that's why, as John said, in the most recent quarter, our customers, and this is something most people don't real about, realize about us, our customers paid us higher amounts on their bills than at any point in the history of the company, $61.80, the highest amounts. Now, that's not because we've raised their prices on them. That's because we've earned a deeper relationship with our customers by providing great experiences. And we've done it with real simplicity and transparency. We've taken this confusing category that people have no idea how to shop and made it incredibly simple and approachable with people that are fired up about being approachable. And those uncarrier moves that John talked about are things that basically systematically address what frustrates people about this industry that's been dominated by a duopoly who's been imposing rules and restrictions and constraints and poor value and forcing customers to make a trade-off that with the uncarrier they don't have to make, a trade-off between having low prices and a, and a poor experience or high prices and a better experience. We can offer both a great value and a great experience. And that's what each of these, uh, these moves we've made over the past two years, now on our eighth one and leading into nine and 10, have really been all about. Now, as John said, it's built on a, a set of pillars. Uh, the first one we'll talk about, number two, is a great sales and service experience. And I'll tell you, when John came into the company two and a half years ago, we embarked upon changing the culture of T-Mobile US in a fairly profound way. Um, and, and, and really put in a principle that said, the frontline people, the people that work with our customers, the frontline is first because customers are first. Now look, in big companies, you have plenty of executives that go around like robots and say, our people are our most important asset and so not, on. Not here. <laughs> but, but look, what, we, what we've done is we've changed in a radical way the culture of the company to center the company around our people that deal with customers, to put them in charge. You know, we often tell ourselves and our people that we can learn everything we need to know to run this company just by talking to the people that talk to customers, by listening. These uncarrier moves, people ask us, where do you guys come up with these things? You know, do you sit around and, you know, come up with them on your own? Of course not. We talk to our people. They tell us what to do, and that's the, that's the culture that we've put in. We've gone, as John said, from being consistently in last place in J.D. Powers to consistently first or second, and we believe we've got the people and the culture and the tools with a few more pieces to come together this year in IT to consistently break away from the pack and be number one over time. Now, it's also built not just on an, a sales and service cultural experience, but on a network experience. And I'll tell you, I've been in this industry um, for a long time, since uh, late 2001, early 2002. I've never seen a network transformation like the one that's just been completed and is now underway by our team, led by Neville, and he's gonna tell us more about where we're headed. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's jump straight into the slides here. So, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, this one's worth about a million square miles of LTE coverage um, in 2015. And the great story in terms of network advancement, as John said, two years ago we were stood up here on this stage and we had nothing in terms of LTE coverage in the US, absolutely nothing. And in two short years, um, we now have the fastest and one of the leading LTE propositions in the United States, up against two huge, huge competitors. So this map is transformational for us. The map on the right, which equates to about 300 million covered people, pops as we'd say, in terms of coverage, that looks awful like the Verizon advertising campaign that they put half a billion dollars plus behind every year. 2015 is about leveling the playing field for T-Mobile US against two huge carriers who have maintained a position of dominance on coverage for well over a decade. That's a remarkable, remarkable year. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. The good news is we're already at 265 plus million covered people. We fi finished 2014 at that number and we'll advance, we've already advanced that number. We're very close to 270 right now. 280 mid-year and then we close on this 300 million pops target by the end of the year. But it's not just about pops. That's the important message behind this slide. 
Look at the coverage footprint. The US, as you guys know, is a massive, massive continent. Finally, we have within our reach, within our grasp, and I've been working on this network best part of two decades, we have an opportunity to match the Verizon and AT&T coverage and deliver a truly, truly exceptional customer experience. So how do we get there? Multiple things are happening. Um, we're refarming Spectrum, introducing LTE into areas where we only had GSM coverage prior. Now HSPA, the vision for our business is all LTE as soon as we can, you know, as soon as we can get there. So LTE in our PCS band, um, converting a lot of our old GSM sites that have been GSM for many years to LTE. The second and probably more important piece, how we really advance that last 20 million pops, major square miles of coverage, is we have low band spectrum. So we've never had low band spectrum as part of the T-Mobile portfolio. About a year ago, we closed a transaction with Verizon and we secured some 700 megahertz spectrum, which we are furiously deploying. Um, we're not just deploying the spectrum, we're providing the handsets and the terminals into our customers' hands. And within a couple of quarters, we had deployed major cities as of the end of 14, and we have major terminals and handsets into customers' hands. Everything that we will do from an LT perspective in 15 and on will cover band 12, the 700 megahertz A block. We're already up and running in major cities, DC, Philly, Dallas, Houston, Cleveland, Minneapolis, list goes on. And the great news is we have a lot of low band spectrum to move into. We will need more. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, big opportunity for us to expand and fill out our low band spectrum reach. But for me, this is the fulfillment of a dream for T-Mobile US. And our customers and our employees especially are very, very excited about what we can bring in 15 with this coverage map. If I go to the next slide, um, and I won't spend, I promise, as much time on these slides as I did on the first one. Um, speeds. You heard a lot from the German team um, around the importance of speed for customers. Not only are we the fastest LTE network in the US, we also have the lowest latencies. So think about the acceleration on that car you have. Um, that's what latency is all about, a very, very fast access to the content that you want to see. This is amazing. Can you imagine being Verizon and AT&T with their strength and muscle in the US and seeing us exceed and move past them in terms of performance? And this is based on millions of customer data sets. This is crowdsourced data. I get a report every morning with almost 100,000 customer samples every day that reinforce this point that we have the fastest LTE. Now it's game on, right? Love a competition, we love it. That's part of this leadership team. Verizon is chasing us very, very hard. I'm sure this sticks in their craw every morning, every week, when they see that we have the fastest LTE, and we came from nowhere, and they were the, fast to L the first to LTE in the US. Major achievement, how we got there, wideband LTE. Braxton will talk about the Metro PCS transaction, how far ahead we are on the schedule we talked about, not even two years ago. Big, big benefit from that transaction was spectrum, highly contiguous, common banded spectrum coming across from Metro. We've been able to put down a lot of committed and dedicated spectrum to LTE. We call that wideband LTE, 30 or 40 megahertz of committed spectrum. Verizon is now getting there. AT&T actually can't get there with contiguous spectrum. We'll talk about Sprint later. But you can see where Sprint is in terms of competitive performance on LTE at this point in time. Over on the right-hand side, we're delivering all those speeds, capabilities at a period of phenomenal growth. So I think you've heard from other presentations, this industry is finally at a sweet spot where the device and the handset, the handset and network combination deliver a, a very fulfilling experience which is comparable to mobile broadband. Finally, and we've been working on that for a long, long time as an industry, it's there. Customers love what we're doing. They're very excited about what they digest on these phones. We have great terminals, great network, lots of usage, but in a very good position to support that. And I'll talk about that quickly on the next slide. A lot of data on here, I'll try to be brief on um, yeah, the left-hand side of this slide, you can see spectrum holdings per customer. So there's often this discussion about, well, T-Mobile's doing great. How long can they make that happen? Well, if you look at our spectrum portfolio, and that's clearly what's shown here for us in the competition, our mid-band spectrum portfolio, which is the lion's share of the spectrum we own, is one of the most robust and strongest in the industry, pre and post the recent AWS3 auctions. And this is where scale is our friend, it's very, very tough for our big competitors with their scale to invest and do the things on the network they need to do to support the LTE performance that we can deliver. 
So that's our big opportunity. I look at where AT&T and Verizon are, old networks built on low band grids. We have the most dense network in the US. Combination of Metro and T-Mobile has allowed us to build great density. On top of that, lots of LT spectrum, and then the compounding effect is great LT performance. Our competition can't match that today. The only players that could is Sprint. They have a lot of 2.5 gigahertz spectrum depicted in that white block. There's a lot of uncertainty, I think, even within the Sprint business about how and when and where they're going to deploy that spectrum. On the right-hand side, why are we all LTE? You can see, I think you guys all know the story, LTE is vastly more efficient. LTE Advanced is coming, a lot of features and capabilities that allow us to push the envelope with a very dense network and an advanced technology. Last slide from me. Um, we're kind of very proud of being on the front edge of innovation with major players in the US marketplace. Um, we were the first to voice over LTE in the US, national launch, brave, bold, and we're doing very well with that. The first to drive this integration of, of uh, Wi-Fi calling with voice over LTE, and who was at the center of all of that? Apple, not some small brand, Apple. And so we're leading on many, many fronts in the US, driving technology advancement, first to HD voice, things that are very important. These are all very customer-centric attributes. Last one on the list, we're going to continue, and you'll see, those of you that are at Congress next week or tracking the media, you'll see a lot of noise over LTE moving into the unlicensed space. And license assisted access is the LIA acronym there. Us driving that very hard. Strange bedfellows in Verizon actually doing the same thing. But you will see a lot of talk and discussion about how to take LTE into the unlicensed space in the US marketplace because of the scarcity of spectrum. A lot happening, very proud of where we've come. With that, I'll hand to Braxton. Thank you, Neville. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited. Look at what the last two years has done. Absolutely incredible. The last part of our presentation deals with the lean cost structure, which is absolutely critical for the uncarrier. Let's start with the Metro PCS transaction, textbook execution. We now estimate total synergies at nine to 10 billion, three billion higher than our original synergy estimate, driven by two things, almost a billion dollar beat on cost to achieve. The other two billion comes from a massive acceleration of the shutdown of the Metro PCS CDMA networks. We're gonna hit run rate synergy of over 1.5 billion in 2016. And what that does from a cash flow profile is absolutely incredible. And you'll see that reflected in our midterm uh, ambitions. The cost structure, absolutely critical. We took 1.7 billion out in 2013, 1.1 billion out in 2014. It was a lot easier in 2013. Going forward, cost transformation is a significant part of what we're doing. We're looking at the underlying drivers of cost in the business and systemically tackling those one by one to achieve further increases in profitability and cash flow. Looking at our guidance for 2015, again, the thesis here was turn this into a significant growth platform with the right type of customers coming in, translating into double digit service revenue increases which we achieved in the third quarter of last year. Then a substantial ramp up in adjusted EBITDA. 6% expansion of our EBITDA margins in the fourth quarter, while every other major US carrier had a significant reduction in their margins. And you look at our guidance for 2015, 2.2 2 to 3.2 million net additions. Now in 14, we did 4.9. But remember, we started the year with initial guidance of two to three million and adjusted that as we performed throughout the year. Adjusted EBITDA, a 25% increase at the midpoint of our guidance, a 6.8 to 7.2 billion. The third leg of the stool is coming true. And a cash capex profile of 4.4 billion to 4.7 billion, slightly up from our investment levels in 2014. Looking at our midterm ambition, this is an update to what we did two and a half years ago sitting on this stage. 
and you can see some fairly significant differences. Total revenue, seven to nine percent versus a three to five percent original estimate. Adjusted EBITDA, seven to 10 percent. But remember, this is 12 through 17. And embedded in these assumptions is a much higher growth platform. We're continuing to invest in growth, yet still delivering the type of increases on a CAGR that are very, very impressive and important to creating shareholder value. And our free cash flow, 15 to 20 percent, now 13 to 18 percent. Two factors you know, reflected in there. Again, a much higher growth platform going forward, but also a success-based strategy of putting capital to work to drive continued shareholder value. And our adjusted EBITDA margins, 32 to 34 percent, but remember, in a much higher growth scenario. So we're very, very excited about what this is going to do. And the final point I'll make, with 2015 and the guidance that we've given, the implication here is for the first time in a very long time, T-Mobile US is a net generator of cash. On a fully levered, operating free cash flow basis, we will generate substantial cash in 2015 going forward. With that, we would love to uh, get to Q&A, and uh, Nils, take it away. Okay, great. So we have about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, we'll try to mix it up a little bit here with uh, questions in the room and some Twitter questions if we get them. Um, but uh, let's start over here. Sorry. Thanks very much. Uh, it's Nick Delfas. Um, I just had a question going back in time to uh, the Iliad approach, um, which I know probably quite justifiably you didn't pay too much attention to. Um, but is there anything in their approach, um, other than the fact that you have a network, uh, they're still building one in France, but was there something in their approach around IT and how they thought they could uh, save money within your business and simplify IT that you think is interesting and that you might take up? Or was it simply just some, some financial engineering as, as far as you were concerned? When you guys want to start, I'll start. I think they were on drugs. Uh, you know, I mean, seriously, that, you know, it was, I think it was an arrogant statement that they could come into a business as efficiently run as ours and save $10 billion. Um, you know, I have a lot of respect for what they've done, but I think, you know, to a certain extent, it was, it's my, I mean, you get what you pay for with me. Um, I think it was a bit of grandstanding to position themselves in France. I don't think they really thought about it. We, are, we obviously are open to any you know, approach uh, by any company. I think there would have certainly been interest in them as a financial investor, but to think that they had some secret sauce that they were gonna walk in and you know, save in, by the way, a company that is significantly underinvested in IT. Um, you know, so, you know, as the time, especially during the period of, de you know, kind of de decline for T-Mobile US, we were way underinvested in IT and we're catching up like crazy. So there's, you know, certainly no, and there's no secret sauce. So interesting, interesting approach, something we should think about. But I, I think the, hey, we can figure out how to save $10 billion, I think they're smoking rope. And, and they, you know, and I don't think, I, I think outside of an envelope, you know, on the back of a napkin. I don't think they had a clue as to how they were going to do it. But I'll try not to be too opinionated. Okay. I could probably save them some money, by the way. All right, let's go to Dominic here. His hair is longer than mine, though. Sorry, it's not Dominic, it's... Oh, it's <laughs> can I, can I, hold Sorry, on, I'm gonna, get the I'm, next gonna, one. I'm gonna just add on the back of that, too. Do you really think that DT's knowledge and capability around IT and procurement and the things that they, you know, you, we really have to stop and remind you who owns us and what their core competence is and what happens every time we get together as a board. You know, we've got Bruno, you know, and Tim peering down our throat as to things that they believe that we could do more effectively. So, you know, I, I think that's, you know, more of a question is, does Iliad really think that they have more core competence and capability in saving IT and procurement than DT does? Go ahead. Um, so, um, just, just um, an update maybe on, the, uh, on your discussions with the FCC on the incentive auction 
um, how is that going in terms of putting in a, a, a ceiling for the for the big guys um, timing wise um, what what do you expect at this at yeah, this stage I, I think that's a big that's a very big point so let's just play a tape back so the AWS three auctions culminated recently and if you add dish to the big and bigger duopolis you know they controlled 93 percent of the you know the spectrum in the mid band auctions and it was pretty clear. Um, as Neville showed in the chart, though, we have a great portfolio of mid-band spectrum, so we really didn't need much. We spent $1.77 billion for 151 licenses, fit nicely in. But the, 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 what Washington is thinking about is a pair of auctions and a series of objectives for the country, one of which was raising a significant amount of capital to fund public safety and $45 billion was raised against an expectation of about 12 to 15 billion. So you can check that box off. What's happening right now is a positioning in Washington by the big guys to delay the auctions so that they can get a more favorable government regime, possibly a Republican administration, and reload their pockets from all the money they just spent. Um, our position, of course, is supporting Chairman Wheeler and the FCC of let's get these things on track, let's have them as fast as possible. And by the way, if you like this competition thing you're seeing, we need a little help. And, you know, I know Tim's been public on this, and, you know, let's, our positions are very clear. We're not waving a flag saying, you know, holy shit, if you don't help us, we're going to go out of business. We're going to be a successful business. But if you really want to drive significant competition on a scalable way over time, we need low band spectra. I think Washington understands that, and the big question will be timing, and it will be size of the reserve band available for bidders like ourselves. And we're pushing for 50% of that to be in our bailiwick. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still thinking early 16. I think that Washington's going to push it. And I think there's so many scenarios that are positive for us. Somewhere we get support from Washington, and somewhere we don't, and you really push the agenda associated with the industry structure in Washington, which will be good for us as well. Okay, uh, let's take actually one Twitter question. Uh, so we go to our word here. So it's, I think, a question for Neville. Uh, basically, uh, let me read it. You have fast LTE. Where do you stand with Volti and RCS? Real, real quick. So um, I mentioned in the presentation, uh, voice over LTE, uh, first to launch in the U.S. Uh, from T-Mobile. Um, ahead of everybody else, and uh, we have a nationwide launch. Uh, RCS is uh, Rich Communication Services, just translate the, the acronyms. Um, and RCS is, if you think about messaging across an IP platform, especially video messaging, uh, the confluence of all of that, something the industry's been working on for a long time. Don't have an immediate announcement for you, but we'll be right there with everybody else, if not ahead, once RCS comes into the US marketplace, which will be this year. Okay, let's come back to the first row since I over, overstepped you earlier. Thanks. It, it's Paul Marsh from Berenberg. Um, what, what are your expectations for the big competitors' reaction over the medium term here? Um, it sounded from your opening comments like you think that they're constrained by their back books and constrained by their culture, but then it also sounds in your pitch to the FCC, uh, that you don't actually think you're going to get a free ride. So what's, what's embedded in your midterm expectations for the reaction from competitors? Well, for, first of all, I think in 2014, you've seen most of what they have to show, right? I mean, these guys are fighting all out, price changes, watching carefully what to do with their base and understand the significant value if they price down their entire base. And I, I think this is a conversation, again, where the benefits of <coughs> us and DT talking about this, you know, is the, the questions, how does DT respond to competition, what would we do? First of all, the difference with AT&T and Verizon, with all due respect, they're not that good. They, I mean, they really have spent so long not listening to their customers. Um, you know, what we're doing, and, and it sounds like <coughs> we're a small company. We're very visible and transparent and focused, and what we care about is an individual customer's ability to get this device and use it in their life. And we spend, I spend 10 hours a day on Twitter and email talking to individual people. <coughs> they can't do it. They won't do it. You know, they're spoiled, and they're also, 
they created this thing that customers hate. So what we've got is we've got a brand now. This is a big, the you know, biggest evolution in two years <coughs> is the uncarrier brand stands for something. It stands for a commitment to customers to cause significant change to the pain points that they hate. And right now, the biggest fear I would have if I was the big guys is their customers survey that we are doing more for them than they are. So what I get is most of my mail, I get mail from AT&T and Verizon customers thanking me for AT&T's changes that made to them. So that's one of the difficulties, which is what they do. Uh, they're doing towards us. So I, I, last piece I would say is think about AT&T, to use a, use a war analogy or so, their expectation was to generate significant amounts of cash from the wireless business that they would invest internationally as they are in Mexico, other industries like you know, digital security, home security, car of the future, what they're doing now with DirecTV, and you know, so they're not really focused on their core business. And I think Verizon has a significant debt uh, issue that they're dealing with as well, and their margins are under pressure. I think what you saw in the end of 2014 is they tried it in Q4, didn't feel good. They both reported margin pressure and earnings misses, and I, th I, I would actually expect that the strategy 101 will take place in 2015 where they'd rather give a few share points than fight at that level until they figure out what's going to happen. I have a second question. All right, go ahead. One yeah, more. So uh, if you were parachuted into DISH as CEO, what's, what's the best play now? Well, I mean, if that happened, I would just assume that whoever made the decision was the smartest person on the planet. I mean, because, <laughs> come on, give me a break. Um, listen, I, I, you know, I don't shy away from those questions. It, you know, DISH is a question for the United States industry as to what's going to happen. They have a tremendous spectrum portfolio. They have some capability associated with content and distribution to wireless. And you know, it's, a, it's a conversation that our shareholders should have. Uh, but importantly, from a position of strength. You know, right now, you know, what DT has in their portfolio is a company with a brand and a scope and a perspective and a team that can execute. And we will talk to interested parties, but only from a standpoint of value for our shareholders. Um, Dish and we, that makes some sense. I mean, it, it makes some sense from a standpoint of integrating that spectrum and capability and deploying it in our network, and then looking about how you merge some of the content distribution of mobile devices and their base of customers as well. So, yeah, take a look. Thank you. All right, uh, Tim here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, question for John, just in terms of what are the pain points that you think continue to be an issue for customers, uh, or for Mike as well? And then yeah. secondly, I'd love to hear more from Neville about um, you know, why you think that it'll be so difficult for at and and Verizon to follow where you've gone. You've obviously got a, a great spectrum position now, but what, what's structurally challenging that means that even though they're spending you know, in, in dollar terms a lot more, it's going to be hard to keep up with you? I, let's, let's reverse those and come back, and let, let's just celebrate for two seconds here that you just asked us how AT&T and Verizon might be able to catch up with our network position. Uh, and I, you know, I just every now and then, I was on TV the other day, and somebody was telling us, listen, you know, you guys, uh, most people compare you to Amazon. And I'm thinking, come on, give me a break. From where we started, you know, that's a beautiful question. But Neville, go ahead, and then yeah, Michael I, jump I in I on I kind of referenced it briefly in the presentation. It's, it's this site density issue. So if you think about those two big guys and how they built their networks on a low band grid, and now you look at where we are with this consumption and growth in data, you need a much denser cell grid. Mid-band spectrum works very well, very well in major metros to support that type of growth. And we have the most dense network. Us and Metro coming together. The other guys are talking about small cells and DAS systems and some of these other terms they throw around. 12,000 DAS nodes with T-Mobile today as we've integrated these networks. If you go to Manhattan, boroughs of New York, nobody has anything close to the density of network that we have. And so when you combine that density with a lot of spectrum, you can turn off a lot of great LT performance. So the big guys have, here they are with a, a network that was built on a, a low band grid. They have mid band spectrum, but they have this coverage gap between the cells that they have to fill. So you have macro build, you have small cells, you have a host of things that they're all working towards. And they have money, um, but it takes a lot of time to deploy 
those types of capabilities in the US market. And so they have more spectrum coming too, but AWS 3 that John referenced, that's a couple of years away at least before there's this thing in the US where you pay all this money for spectrum, and then you have to clear it. <laughs> so there are incumbents using that spectrum today, and some of them could be on that spectrum for some time. So I look at our spectrum position, the strength we have with a network that's ready you know, for this type of growth. We're in a very good spot and a tough one for the competition to match in the near to medium term. Listen, we're going we're gonna to run out of time, so we'll be brief on this one, but I would say the pain point bucket is almost endless. And, you know, jokingly what Mike and I said, so I, I'll, I'll hint to you that in the middle of March, we're going to launch on Carrier 9, right? And I can tell you that starting now, the internet will be full of rumors as to what it is. And in that list, will be the greatest ideas you could possibly do because it's customers telling you what they want. And we may, we move fast enough that what we plan on doing, we might change and use one of those. <laughs> and I, I tell you, I challenge people every time we do an uncarry move, I can go back to Twitter and point to somebody sitting in a chair alone at their computer telling us what they want. And what's most fun about it, and it resonates with consumers, uh, and business customers uh, coming as well, is it's usually right in your face, which just annoys the shit out of the competition because it's right there. And it's usually a fundamental component of the industry structure that people thought was a component of the way it had to be until somebody completely shifts it. So I, I think it's a, a there's limitless. A, there's a very sincere sense in our company that we're just getting started that we are just getting started solving these customer problems. And you know, part of it is the culture that we've got. As John said, we, we have individual you know, reps, uh, either in care or in retail, that feel 100% comfortable skipping five layers of management or however many there are and going straight to the CEO or to any one of us with an idea that they got from their customer. And we listen. We've got, we've got a, a system that says that's valuable and to be celebrated. And that's where a lot of these ideas come from. And we, there's a real yeah. sense that with the, the eight things plus two or three more we didn't give numbers to, big, bold things we've done that we're just getting started. And, and lastly, there, you know, there was a couple of us sitting over here. You were there uh, last night. We were sitting over here talking. And you know, there's a tipping point issue. Right? So you've got eight uncarrier moves that I guarantee you most of you don't know what they are in general. And so what you've got is this real favorable disposition in AT&T and Verizon where each new move, uncarrier nine comes, and it sits there. And it, it's in and of itself interesting and big, but it's enough for somebody to say, that's it. I've been waiting to go. I'm going now. And it's an opportunity to resell music freedom and international data roaming and any time upgrade. And what you've seen now is a delay in competitors responding. And when you don't respond to the package of uncarrier moves that we have, it's like high school algebra. When you screw up chapter one, chapter two is really hard. And that's part of what's going on. And most of the responses that you see from an AT&T is their very me too poor imitations, trickery intended to feel like it, like they did with data rollover, that pisses customers off even more because it's more of the same asterisk. So I, I think we've got an endless set, but then we've got a huge resell of what we've already did. Done. Excuse I think, I'm afraid we have to call it now. You all have, or many of you have to catch a flight. And, uh, but we'll be at two conferences here in the next two weeks. And uh, so if you have more questions. Nils, I, I, I want to finish by th you know, thanking uh, the shareholders and those that follow DT for your patience. Because I know that on behalf of the team in the US, you know, this kind of start that we were given, again, it was one more. And I know the patience here uh, in Germany and the patience of shareholders for the US to turn out to be something providing value was wearing thin. Uh, and I, I think the, you know, the management of DT should get an awful lot of credit for balancing you know, what they have to do with investing in the U.S. And I, th I think going forward, the, you know, the contribution of the U.S. to shareholders in a number of ways is going to be very positive. So thanks for your patience.
I think uh, we have about 15 minutes right now.